have it in studio with New York Times best-selling author John Gilstrap because, as I said before, they don't track the least selling ones. Good hey. morning. Good morning, John. And also, Joseph Joey Torts for ready. Can I just say real quick, Rob, uh, when I come back to the Eastern Panhandle, there's a lot of things I miss. There's a lot of things I don't miss. I don't miss the traffic. I don't miss not having... We have a, traffic. Yeah, I don't miss not having a good Italian restaurant <laughs> to go to. But w- w- the thing I miss most is, are the people. Uh, I come in last night, mm-hmm. and this lady, Priscilla Anderson, has been cutting my hair for 14 years. And she does a marvelous job. By the and, way. and I called her, and she came in and opened up her shop to cut my hair last night because I got in late. That's the kind of spirit that exists in Eastern Panhandle, and I, that's what, what I miss most. Joe, that's, that's, um, that's respect. I said, let's uh, yeah, respect. Yeah. I, I just I a phone call. And, hey, I need a haircut. John, when you need a haircut, who opens up their shop for you? <laughs> really? <laughs> I, hey, I Rob, know I have very little Rob, the time. don't go there. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw it out. I go to Uncle Joe's Barbershop in, in uh, Martinsburg. Yeah, Uncle and Joe. And you know what? They oh, charge me the same amount that they charge somebody that has Which a whole head Which seems ridiculous. It does. Me, it goes very... But, you know, there's still a lot of show that goes with it. You know, it's like they, it's they a lot of show. Pass scissors over the head and, and oh, what yeah. have you. That, that place like is an institution. They call That's it. a great place. It's, yeah. it's a yeah. it, it, it's a good old fashioned yep. talk trash kind of. Jerry Mays shop. used to call it the Republican barbershop. Well, it is definitely <laughs> swings on the right side of things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, via telephone, the mogul, Delegate Michael Hornby. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, John. I, I'm a little worried that you guys brought in Joe today, so I'm a little skeptical about this interview. Oh, don't worry. Not at all. You do have the right to remain silent, however, just so you know. The, the silver fox has been waiting. Also, I think you have uh, Delegate Gino Chiarelli with you as well. I do. Yeah, Gino should be on the other line. Uh, I invited him on this morning uh, as part of uh, our interview today. Yeah, Gino, are you there? Good morning, Eastern Panhandle crew. How is everybody? <laughs> I've never felt so not Italian, Gino. Gino, that, Gino, that didn't sound Italian at all. It's, you got to be like Gino. You can do better right. now. Yeah, do it again. I can't come out of the gate being the stereotype that you guys all make me out to be. Come on, give me a break. You're in here with uh, with a with a Ferretti and a Sicilian, Gino. Be a stereotype. We don't care. We want to hear it. Give me the accent and do it now. Come on, baby. Come on. <laughs> That's look. Well, if you guys were in the room with me here and you could see the spastic gestures that I'm making, there you go. There you go. I am as stereotypical as people make me out to be. I didn't realize how much of a stereotype I was until I got into politics. Boy, do I feel like a Pazon now. Yeah, there you go, baby. This was like that scene in uh, Beverly Hills Cop, a banana in the tailpipe, man. You know, with Eddie Murphy, you gotta, you gotta bring it. <laughs> I'll see what I can. It's still, it's still technically early. Although you're, you're pretty young, Gina. Did you ever see Beverly, Beverly Hills Cop? No. Is that, that's the one with uh, Eddie no, Murphy. No, Eddie no, Murphy. No, no, I'm thinking of Beverly Hills Ninja with Chris Farley. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> Almost the same movie. <laughs> the thing well, is, Gina really doesn't watch TV at all. He's he's a true millennial. Where he, he, he's really on his phone and, and X or Twitter or whatever it is. That's where he lives. That's I'm right. on I'm on I'm on Twitter way too much. If anything, my phone needs taken from me. All right, so yeah. so Gino, yeah, I got to ask you this because my son got me a book about the Pittsburgh Mafia for Christmas this year, and I'm paging through it, and reading through. All of a sudden, this guy by the name of Gino Chiarelli turns up in my book with a picture, and I sent it to Hornby. I said, "Is this guy related to your buddy?" I uh, I can't confirm nor deny that. On the in, good on, answer, I'm sorry, good, good answer. That's good. That's good. You you won't be brought up for perjury later. Don't worry about it. But, but Grandpa right. Gino called him and said it may have not the be fishes, him. You know. <laughs> I didn't hear either one of you because you both spoke at the same time. Sorry. That's all right. Hey, uh, Mike, let's talk about some legislation that could affect Berkeley County. You highlighted some of it last week and some things that you were working on. Any progress there? Uh, we are making progress. The, the, the bills are moving through, um, through the committees. Um, Can you review the bills for us? So I've got a number of bills. Um, obviously, I've got my secondary school uh, like the WDB SSAC bill um, that'll be coming up in education uh, next week. What does that bill do, the, Mike? Uh, it just puts the WVSSAC under rules, so they have to report their rules to the rulemaking review committee. Um, it, it essentially makes them a part of this. It's a start to make them a part of the government. Okay. Uh, my health care sharing ministry's Freedom to Share Act is... Um, in judiciary and should be running on Monday. That is uh, allowing them to 
continue to do what they do without being under the insurance commission. And now, you know, if, if anybody has any issues with, with that, it'll go to the AG's office if there's any consumer complaints. Okay. Um, I know we've had a couple of employees that use that, so it's been kind of, I've been working on that for about a year. And what else do you have? Um, the small business payroll tax credit, I'm running that again. That's running through um, economic development. Um, that, that'll be running next week. The raw milk um, piece of legislation will be running through ag next week. Um, and then allowing teachers to bank their personal and sick days. Um, that one's a big one uh, that'll be running through House Ed, too. Has, has anything been passed yet of official nature? Uh, the only one that's actually gone through all the committees is the complete audit of um, the, the, the county school boards. The uh, audit will do a complete audit of every county's um, school board. So that's sitting on... Uh, house rules waiting. It's a resolution, so it'll come out later on in the, in the session. And this was inspired by some of the abuses of the COVID money? Well, yeah, it was inspired by the Upshur County issue, um, lots of fraud, um, and this started with just one receipt that somebody looked into. It turned out to be a $375,000 um, plus. That's what they found so far. So this was inspired by that, and uh, the Committee on Education helped me get that through pretty easy. We all thought it was uh, really important to do. So, Anything found in Berkeley or Jefferson County locally, Mike? Um, uh, nothing nothing eye-opening or anything like that. There were a couple of, uh, uh, of the eight receipts they sent in. There was a couple of technical violations, but no fraud or anything like that in, in, in our local county. So I, I don't anticipate it, but uh, a full review needs to be done. Um, of all all the boards of education, in my opinion, Mike, did the audit uh, of these school boards uh, was that done just with respect to the COVID money, or was that an overall audit? So they did the actual the legislative uh, branch did a review of the COVID money, and that's when they put that report out. Um, and, but this audit will be a complete and comprehensive audit of all. Uh, school boards and all finances, so federal, state, and local. So they'd be looking at local share um, as well as your state share as well as your federal money. Um, we haven't done one in a long time, and I think it's uh, it's about time we looked into it as a legislation and said, you know, let's do an audit, let's find out where this money's been spent and how it's been spent, and make sure that all the county uh, school boards are spending it correctly. So this is the education committee that's doing the audits? statewide um it'll actually go to a special committee of government finance and then it'll be assigned to um the, the auditor will actually do the the, the uh audit oh, the state auditor's office okay yes so right now they, they 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 are audited but they're only audited on a very minuscule um minimal amount that they can choose what they're audited on um because obviously this is a comprehensive audit it, it's it's going to take some time um and and they are required most school boards are required to do their own audits um but this will be the, the state auditor to do it now the legislature when, when I, I know just from experience when we go down these various paths uh and, and this one seems to be okay let's look at school finances does the legislature have something in mind as to what the end game might be if they turn up some some problems with these audits well, you know, we found issues in one county, and, and we've addressed that. Mm -hmm. The state um, board of education superintendent you know, had to resign or moved on because of it. Um, I think it's it's time we do it, and I think we also need. I've got another one that's, uh, you know, looking at the school aid formula. So to look and try and update that completely, um, to to move it into the 21st century. I think it's still hold back, um, and the way we do it is 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 you know, archaic. So um, it's it, it's in conjunction with the both. We can do an audit, and then we can also do a uh, a real comprehensive uh, study into the school aid formula, how that's working. Are you, as part of that, Mike, in the school aid formula, looking into the penalty basically that exists for having your own local levy? Um, yes, that is something I am very into. It, right now, we're penalized because we have a levy, and and, and it, it's not right. But we also have the ability to use our excess levy to actually raise our school 
uh, teacher salaries. And I don't think we've explored that as a county, um, and I'd like to look into that in the future. I think that's what Dale Lee has suggested as a way of enacting locality pay on our own. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that's, that's something we have the ability to, or the school board uh, members have the ability to do. And I think when the next levy comes up, they should be looking at that uh, very closely. And and that that ability to do that's been around for a while. Is there any sense it why? Has. Yeah. Is there any sense why we haven't done that? Well, you're going to have to ask the board of education uh, members and those people that are running um, in the election. I yeah. You know, We've been talking locality pay forever. We can't seem to get it done down here because of the body of 100. But we should be able to do something locally. And maybe we don't do some of the improvements and things that, that we have. And maybe we do invest in our teachers. Um, that, that's up to them, in my, in my opinion. Well, and I raise that point because I can just hear legislators from other parts of the state saying, well, you have an ability to do this. And yet I don't see you doing that. So why should we sign on to locality pay as a, as a statewide policy? And, and, and that is the, the, the locality pay. And I've been pretty consistent on this. When I look at a, a legislator from the South, they look at me and say, you have this ability. Why are your teachers worth more? I understand your houses are worth more, but a teacher is doing the same job. They cannot go back to their constituents and say, I voted to give Berkeley County teachers a raise, and I didn't vote to give my teachers a raise. And that's their argument, and I understand it. I mean, I get it. We're a totally different county than most of the counties down down in here. I also understand, Mike, that there's a limit to how much that local levy can go to increase teacher pay. Uh, and I think there is. I, th- I think we do enact it already. Your starting salary do, here is, har- is larger than it is elsewhere. We do in, a, in our, in our um, levy, but the excess levy, which is the second levy, we do have a much more um, broader ability to, to do things. Um, so uh, I specifically asked... Um, you know, when they were presenting their budget, how how we could uh, address this, and that was the answer they gave me. That the, the excess levy is where we've got a lot more um, leeway, if you will. Hey, Mike, is there anything on the docket that affects the either the the issues regarding education in in the uh, in the state, such as curriculum issues or truancy issues or? Discipline, you know, the, the drumbeat that we hear over and over again. Is there on? Is there pending legislation that that addresses those yeah, issues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, John, we've got we we included uh, the elementary schools in the discipline um, bill from last year, so we updated the uh, elementary schools. As far as curriculum, um, I don't think it's our job to really dictate curriculum, but we are working on. Um, we we made it easier for teach the the the. the the training that they do each year, we made it every three years. So we are addressing a lot of those issues. Um, but the, the only thing that I know that's passed is the uh, discipline uh, for elementary schools. And the elements of that is what? Uh, basically, it's taken our discipline bill uh, that we ran last year, uh, laid out, you know, and, and applied it to elementary schools. Most elementary schools... The child is in the same classroom all day, so we had to adjust it where you can't you, you can remove the the child and, and and they can go if they have serious discipline issues. We we laid out how that works, um, so they get need to be removed to another class as opposed to for a period. We bring Gino in here on this mic, uh, and unless you have another uh, bill you no, want to make sure I, we know I think about. Gino's got a big bill on, uh, and I think a big win for him. I think he's got a big bill on second reading today, so I, I'd, I'd love to have you have him talk about it. Hey, Gino. Sure. So I, uh, I've come back to this session as opposed to the first one with a very different perspective. I know how the, uh, how the process works. I know how to massage bills, get them through, talk to the right people, um, foster them along here. So I do have a bill on second reading today, and it's a bill that I'm very, very motivated to get through, House Bill 4867, uh, that would require pornography companies online to verify the age of their users. Uh, I use language from Utah, and, and it seems like that wherever this, uh, this kind of legislation is implemented across the country, there are real results. Eight or nine states have already done it. I think it's been introduced in 14 or 15 states 
uh, this year, or at the very least pre-filed for the legislative sessions, and it does seem to be exacting some results. So um, bipartisan support. I have I had 10 co-sponsors on it. One of them is, is a Democrat. Um, I'm not expecting any controversy out of that one, so we should be passing that out of the House hopefully tomorrow. What would the penalties be for a violation of this law, do you know? So there, it opens up a private cause of action where um, parents, if, if, they're, if their minor children have been exposed to pornographic content, they can, um, they can pursue civil, civil, civil penalties. And then it also has permissive authority for the attorney general uh, to, to go after these companies, $10,000 per day that the entity operates an internet website in violation of the age verification requirements. How long would they have to get these age verification methods in place? That's, uh, it, this would be, as soon as we pass it, it this law would be in effect. Hmm. What does age verification mean? Enter a birthday? So what they, what they have to do is the online websites, this doesn't cost the state any money, this is on the, the responsibility of the website. They would have to verify the user's age through means other than simply clicking and typing numbers into a box. Um, we have definitions in the bill that provide for digitized identification card, meaning that the companies would have to uh, look at somebody's state-issued ID in order for them to verify. There's also uh, penalties for the company if they retain, sell, or use that data inappropriately. I, 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 just, I'm, <laughs> I'm just imagining the... Who's going to give their driver's license over to somebody who runs a porn site? It should, it should cut down a... on the traffic. <laughs> that's it really sure. that's, should, that's, should that's, cut that's, it that's down a lot. That's a question that people are going to have to ask themselves yeah. if they want to do that. Yeah, yeah that's a good... <laughs> that's full commitment right there. Here's my, here's my mother's maiden name. And, uh, what else do I have here for you? Uh, hey, uh, John, you might find this interesting as well. Gino sits on the Committee on uh, Fire Departments and Emergency Medical Services. John is a former career firefighter and uh, EMT, so... Uh, what kind of legislation, Gino, are we looking at this session in regards to firefighters and EMTs? Well, one thing that I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. One thing that I'm personally working on that the, the firefighters brought to me an idea is obviously we know that we have retention issues with firefighters across the state. So um, we looked at a little bit of state code that says that if you're injured in the, in the line of duty and you can no longer be a firefighter, there is state code currently that says if you are able to gain meaningful employment anywhere else, you have to get that employment before you can collect your disability. But the, the problem with the code is it's not dependent on whether or not if you are hired, it doesn't matter whether or not you're able to gain said meaningful employment anywhere around you. If you are a, simply able to be hired, you can't collect your disability. So uh, we're going to try and fix that saying that if you're injured doing that kind of work, whether you're a firefighter or a police officer, you should be eligible to collect that, uh, that disability regardless of whether or not you can work as a cashier or something at Walmart. Okay, a couple things. First of all, I was a volunteer firefighter. I was not a career firefighter. And um, since the vast majority of firefighters in West Virginia are volunteers, is there a piece of this legislation for them? That would be this. Is, so this is specifically for the, uh, for the professional firefighters. They came to me for it. And to be honest, unfortunately, I have two committees that overlap. Uh, it happens to me a lot, it seems. But I have seniors, children, and family issues. And I have firefighter committees at the same time, and I end up at the seniors committee more than I do in the in the firefighters one. Because that's always been you know an issue where you have these these folks that pull themselves out of the racket, oh dark early, and go and and fight a fire. They fall through a floor or something happens, and they're kind of and that did happen to you. They, well, that did happen to me actually, and um, I, I was lucky. But um, we should do something to protect them to give you know because whatever their income stream is that they're not able to do anymore is is in jeopardy because they were volunteering to help their neighbors yeah fair point gino in your, in your neck of the woods in west virginia are are you relying on paid uh emergency responders or are you is mostly volunteer and gino's out of monongalia county by the way go ahead gino uh we have we have a good blend of both quick answer <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty pretty direct that's yeah that's uh if you want more specifics about it, that is this is not my area of expertise to be perfectly honest with you uh joe scatler who would, would know know a whole lot about this stuff well, i'm gonna talk about your senior children and family issues committee uh gino does, does that also overlap with the split of dhhr now into dhs and such 
No, that one that one missed us completely. That was all health and human resources. Okay, so what separates what you do as opposed to what that committee does? You know, you're not the first person to ask something like that. Um, I think with our senior children and families issues, it's it's pretty hyper focused on a couple of different things. Um, I know last year when there was some talk about um, ID for pornography, that was some, an idea that came through our committee. There's also the the parents' bill of rights is something that's up in committee, probably being discussed right now, actually. Um, it's something that I personally have some concerns about, but I'm being told over and over that the language is solid and the Alliance Defending Freedom is a national organization that has gone, gone around to other states and they have, um, they, it, it seems to be some, it seems to be tested in, in court, so. Um, and we passed the uh, the, par- the teachers' bill of rights yesterday through education also too, true. which uh, lays out. So so there's uh, a lot of bill of rights uh, bills coming through this year. Does the teachers' bill of rights contain the right to not be violently attacked by a student in yes. your classroom? For yes. instance, that's exactly what we addressed. Where where a teacher has the right to say, I do not want to teach this child. Does the teacher have the right to defend him or herself? It does not go that far, um, but it it, it's, it does lay out um, a, a, a lot of things that teachers have been complaining about. So I, I think it's a a really good uh, start to because I think, as I've told you before, I think this is a you've got parents, you've got teachers, and then you've got the kids, and all of them need to be held accountable. Truth, Gino. I know you're on the substance abuse committee as well, and I see that you have some legislation involving needle exchange. It says prohibit the HB forty eight sixty six prohibit needle exchanges from providing services in West Virginia. I know uh, Bill Kearns from our local health department. Uh, is very much in favor of harm reduction programs. It seems as though this legislation here would hinder that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. I am not, for the record, I am not against harm reduction as, a, um, as an option when it comes to people with substance abuse disorder. What I am against is programs that enable further use and don't make any progress in terms of people getting better. And the reason why I submitted that piece of legislation is because, first of all, as a, as a delegate from the southeast portion of Montegale County, it is my duty to represent their concerns while I'm in Charleston. And other than roads, needles are the, one of the biggest topics that I hear about. And I've, oh, I'm, I'm, I, wish I, could, I, I wish I could show you guys the pictures that I received from people of needles on the rail trail up in Morgantown, the mountains of needles that I see in the, in the catwalks and alleyways by, uh, in, in Morgantown. I hear horror stories from business owners that have had their property defaced. They're opening up their, 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 their businesses to see fecal matter on their porch. Tenants are opening up their, their front door, and they're finding people, paraphernalia, um, right there in, in, you know, where, they, where they live. There has to be, there has to be an answer. There ha- we have to do something about that. And I went to our needle exchange program in Morgantown. I, you know, just, I went through the program in plain clothes just to see what it was like, and I was only in there for 15 minutes. I gave them my ID, and I walked out of there with a bag full of stuff. I walked out of there with meth pipe. I walked out of there with foils and tourniquets and caps and bubblers, all of this stuff. Not once did I talk to a medical professional. Not once did I receive any, any referral to a specialist. There was no coordination of care. There was no treatment planning. So it's hard for me as someone to, to see the positive in a program that simply gives people the tools to use more drugs. I don't understand what, what's, what's productive about that. So I submitted the, the needle exchange ban. I don't think that it's going to go anywhere just because um, there is a, a whole lot of pushback on it. But I do think that the needle, progr- uh, needle exchange programs, they, they need work. The needle exchange program, in theory, should provide for, in fact, the exchange of the needle as opposed to the discarding or the littering of the needle. Is that not the backbone of that program? That's, that is what they say. That is the whole, the whole purpose of the program. But how it actually ends up working is if you get a bunch of needles from the needle, needle exchange program, and this isn't me speculating, I've, I've, this is what I've heard from people because I used to be an addiction counselor in Morgantown. I would talk to people frequently that went to these programs. They would tell me that if you take one needle back, they will give you 10. If you take back 11, they will give you 20. So they will round up 10. So as long as you bring back one, they will round up to 10. Those needles end up all over the place. I have heard this, this horrible story about someone that was weed whacking in a graveyard in Morgantown. Uh, they hit a needle in the graveyard with their weed whacker, and it shot and sucked their opponent uh, or stuck, stuck their partner in the leg. That's, that is not public health. That clearly that needs addressed. 
And we wonder why we have a drug problem or, you know, what, how we exacerbate drug problems. Yeah, that clearly it's, needs to be addressed and cleaned up. I, I, I would not want to shut the entire program down. And just some anecdotal evidence, it wasn't that many years ago when I go for a walk and I would find, uh, and it wasn't here in this community, needles uh, on the ground. And with the implementation of a harm reduction program, I don't see those needles any longer because they're now being exchanged, I presume. Uh, I don't I don't assume that nobody's addicted any longer. I just assume that they are now being exchanged because now when I go walking, I don't have to worry about stepping on a needle. I haven't seen a needle in years. I have never seen it. They're still attached to a syringe? Yes. But, but Gino's point is, and it is very valid. It is. There's got to be a quid right. pro quo here. Yeah. If you're yes. going to have and a I, needle I exchange, there's got to be something else that's required, like it. counseling something and rehab. We have, to, we, ha we have to do more because yeah. I, I am not the only one. There are other radio Ugh. talk show hosts in Morgantown that have. we have all noticed that over the last 10 years, and I've been in Morgantown long enough to say this, that over the last decade, there has been a noticeable decline in quality. All right, and we have people that are coming in from all over the eastern seaboard. Again, I worked at a, at, a, at a methadone clinic. I worked with a lot of these people. They would specifically pick Morgantown off of a list. They would get on a Greyhound from places as far as Mississippi, Arkansas, Georgia, to come to Morgantown because they know the kind of climate that is available to them. They know what services, what programs are available. And there are a lot of great, great programs in the area. That's not what I'm saying, but there are a lot of people here that are taking advantage of uh, of the services that we offer in Morgantown, and these are not they're not good actors because let let's let's be real. A lot of the people that you see, especially in Morgantown, hanging out downtown, nodding off on the sidewalk, shooting up in a parking lot, they don't care about getting better. They don't care about becoming a productive member of society again. They just want to do whatever they want to do, and they don't care one bit about what you know about what you or I think. Gino, thanks. Appreciate your clarification on that. Mike, final word goes to you before we end the segment. No, no, I, I, I think uh, I, Gino did, summed it up pretty well. I, I will defend our Berkeley County harm reduction. I, I know ours is a one-for-one -one exchange. Um, I've been informed of that, and I have seen a huge decline in the amount of needles in the parks and, and things like that. So um, I, I do hear Gino, and, and, and I, I believe that, that this is kind of a regional thing, And um, but I agree with what he's saying. All right. Mike, Gino, thank you very much. Appreciate your time Thanks, this morning. Guys. Thanks, guys. Delta Thanks. House bill is going nowhere, but we're pushing it. The, the, Always the, pushing the, it. the Delta House bill? The Delta House. Or the, yeah. What's the Delta House bill? We're, we're moving the uh, the primary election. I think we talked about oh, that. Oh, oh okay. We're moving to the third, third, third uh, Tuesday in February. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Mike, so thank we're, you. We're, we're, see you, guys. Thank you, Gino.